Good morning, everybody. My name is Cindy Brief. I am the CEO of the Coral Springs Regional Chamber of Commerce and the Coconut Creek Chamber Council. I'd like to thank the City of Coral Springs Economic Development Office, as well as FPL for sponsoring this event. We couldn't do it without your support and we appreciate everything you do. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our exciting guest speaker. David Levy is CEO, founder, and cloud IT expert of IBIS Technology, a fast-growing IT service provider for small businesses and mid-market enterprises, headquartered in Coral Springs, Florida. With over 25 years of experience in both finance and information technology systems, David and his team of IT experts specialize in helping businesses migrate to the cloud. His specialty is in, is in aligning his clients' technology investments in providing the most cost-effective technology-based networking, cloud-hosted virtual desktops, and operating systems for businesses of all sizes. Today, David will be presenting a workshop entitled, The Cloud is Not Fake News. Don't leave your business behind. David is also the author of the ebook, Ending the Cloud Confusion, Understanding Cloud IT. This ebook on the fundamentals of cloud computing provides an excellent overview for the beginner to the advanced IT expert in a very simple way to understand. As a bonus, David will be distributing a complimentary ebook to everyone here today. Oh, yay. Okay. David has been a member of the Coral Springs Regional Chamber of Commerce for almost a decade. This Keynes alumnus holds a Bachelor of Business Administration and Finance from the University of Miami School of Business and is also a proud graduate of J.P. Uh, Taravella right here in Coral Springs. Please welcome David Levy. I was going to say I'm a senior at Terravella <laughs> and in DECA. Good morning, everybody. Who here is the big Powerball winner from uh, last week? Oh, nobody. Yeah, well, that's funny that you say that. It's funny that you say that because that was... That was a discussion I had. I had my J.P. Terravella. I'm not a junior or senior. I had my 30-year reunion a couple of weeks ago. 30 years, uh, one, of the one of the conversations, and I, you know, it was really a lot of fun meeting with all your friends, and of course the Powerball was growing, and so a bunch of us were entering or, or you know, buying some collective Powerball tickets, and it got me thinking, if I won the Powerball, would I be here this morning? And, you know, your first reaction is, well, I'd have to, I'd have to tell Cindy, hey, too bad. <laughs> Good luck to everybody. Would I continue? You know, the real question is, would you continue doing what you're doing if you, if you came into a huge windfall? And you know what? The answer is yes. I would be here because I wouldn't want to leave anyone in the lurch. But I would probably be a lot more relaxed, right? I'd be a lot more relaxed. I'd have nothing to lose. And so this morning, I'm going to talk to you as if I won the lottery. I'm going to take my jacket off. Hopefully, we can all relax. And, uh, you know, it's a small, intimate crowd, so, you know, I, I have a bunch of slides, I have the cloud is not fake news uh, agenda, and a bunch of things that I can go through, but in a crowd like this, you know, we can ask questions, please interrupt, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we can, take the, we can take the conversation in other directions, it doesn't have to be by the, you know, by the PowerPoint slide. You know, when you start talking about uh, cloud servers and desktops, and even Cindy had to stumble over a couple of words because it's a bunch of jargon. It's a bunch of, I don't know, you hear the word server, and people's eyes glaze over. They, you know, they're like, that doesn't apply to me, or I don't know anything about it, so I'm not even going to listen, and they tune out at that point. My goal is so that none of you, to turn, none of you tune out. Uh, if, if it's not advanced enough and you're like, man, I already know this stuff, then you'll have to be patient with me. Uh, if you're like most people that I talk to and would love to get a better idea of what the hell everyone's talking about, then 
welcome, and I hope it's, I hope it's a learning experience. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, more than the, than the bio. Uh, I was, like, I, like Cindy said, I graduated from Terravella uh, in a former life with a finance degree. Graduating in 1992, I went to work on Wall Street as a NASDAQ trader. Uh, you know, I did that, and it was great. I was in my mid-20s, and I was you know, moderately successful at it, but that's what happened to all of my hair. <laughs> and, and on that trading desk, I was always the guy that everyone came to with the technology problem. Hey, my station's not doing this. It's not doing that. I'd be like, leave me alone. I'm trying to make a living here. No, I was always the guy to help. So self-taught, self, you know, my first computer, let's see here. Hmm. Let's see, I had it up here. Yeah, that was my first computer. Bought in 19, that's not actually mine. But this, uh, this Apple IIe I bought with my bar mitzvah money in 1983. And I had been turned on to computers by a math teacher that I had. And so, you know, does this look familiar to anyone? Anybody, the young kids here, don't be shaking your head yes. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that was what I bought with my bar mitzvah money. It was my first Apple IIe computer, and I've been an IT dork ever since. Um, never really planning on going into business in IT, but, you know, they say find what you're good at, and I was no longer good at trading, or I was getting no longer good at trading. So I'm like, let me leave now before I end up in a bad place, and uh, IT is where I landed. So came back here, bless you, came back here in uh, 1999, did some work in low voltage cabling, which is basically the wires in the walls that connect all the computers and telephones. From there, learned a little bit about networking computers and having them talk to each other, which was obviously something that was becoming very big at the time. I had this unique idea that at one point in time, and this wasn't happening, I was living in Chicago at the time, uh, I was like, man, it would be great if they only had one pipe would bring in TV would bring in voice and would bring in internet into your home and then you could share that anywhere in your house. And that was my idea. It was like I was going to get into that because nobody was doing that. Well, now everybody has that and you don't, you know. But uh, so that was what spurred me to go into IT and I came back to South Florida and I worked in cabling for a little while and I started doing that and started helping local businesses uh, with their computer issues and, and that's how I really started. So. I did that, local IT guy, the IT guy, for about uh, 15 years. And there were a lot of things that made it so that I didn't sleep at night, okay? I knew that I was good, better than your average business owner, not as good as an IT engineer necessarily, but I knew that I was pretty good. But was everything I was putting in place really working? And when you don't sleep at night, it's like, well, I know I have backups in place and we're backing up this business's data and we're doing all this, but is it really working? And, and if it's not working, if a disaster really happens, what if it's my fault that the business lost all of their valuable information? So that takes us to our, the next phase of IT, which is the cloud. Okay, and so I started, I started doing cloud services. I started looking into what I was doing. How can I deliver what I do in a different way? In a different way where I'm not the, the ultimate brain on the network. I'm not the, the one who knows everything. Hopefully there's people that know more. But how can we deliver this IT to businesses and give them the same level of comfort, the same level of security, the same level that companies have or companies should have, but at the same time make it affordable. So oops. I started selling this esoteric thing called cloud services, right? Well, what is the cloud? Great first question. It's the first question everybody asks when you go up and give an IT speech. What is the cloud? And who, does anybody want to answer or give an idea? of what they think the cloud is. I mean, most people I talk to, they reach into their pockets, they pick out their phone, they're like, I have, I have the cloud. <laughs> Apple tells me I have iCloud. I'm a cloud user. Well, you are, and you're all cloud users. You're all cloud users if you use email. You're all cloud users if you use Facebook. You're all cloud users if you use 
online banking. You're all cloud users because the cloud is a marketing term that really is equal to the internet. And we'll get into that in a second, what that really means. But the cloud sounds really fantastic and there's a reason it's called the cloud and it's a really boring and unexciting reason as to why it's called the cloud related to how pictures were drawn in networking schematics or drawn. But really, it's nothing more. It sounds like it's great. People look up. People want to know if their stuff is really in the air. But it's not. The cloud is the, cloud is the internet. And what is the internet? The internet is, let's see if I have the, oh, OK. So let me tell a story. Let me tell a story. That's one good way to. <laughs> Well, it's going to lead me to my next. It's going to lead me to my next thing about how the what the internet really is. But here's the perfect metaphor. And I do this a lot uh, with in, when talking to people about what the cloud is, because it gives a tangible it gives a tangible idea about what you're doing when you use the cloud or when you use the cloud for your business. So, my family moved here in 1984 from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I was 14 at the time, and when my family moved here, there was one thing that you're not aware of when you move to South Florida that everyone in South Florida is aware of. I mean, we have, we're moving our whole, our family of five moving from St. Louis, Missouri. We have years and years of stuff. And what's the one thing you don't realize when you get to South Florida that you don't have? A basement. <laughs> Right? We're moving all our stuff from St. Louis, and we don't have a basement. And so what are we going to do with all of our stuff? It's our stuff. I could put it in the attic. Side story, I put my cleats in the attic, and I, sent, I gave them to my son, who just started playing football. After five years of being in the attic, they, they disintegrated the first time he put them on and took his first step. <laughs> So, uh, Dad, those, that's not going to work. The attic is a great place for your stuff to get really ruined, right? Yes. So, uh, you can't put it in the attic, but it's your stuff, and you want a safe place to put it. So, what do you do? You rent a storage unit, okay? A storage unit is very much the cloud for your stuff, okay? They provide you a a right-sized unit that you can either increase in size or decrease in size, right? It's safe, it's climate controlled, you put your stuff in it nice and organized, it's there, your lock is on it, it's their container, but it's all your stuff, right? I mean, even with storage wars, they have to go in and have like a, a warrant to be able to open your thing. It's your stuff, it's just in a storage facility that's not at your house, <laughs> That's not in your closet, that's not in your attic, that's not in your garage, that's not being flooded. It's a, it's a perfect metaphor for storing your stuff in the cloud, okay? And what is the cloud? What is the virtual storage space that you put it into? Well, what if I told you the internet, the cloud, the websites that you go to. Going to a website is such a misnomer because you're not really going anywhere, okay? It seems like you're taking a trip over here to Bank of America, but you're not really going over there. You're not taking a trip anywhere. Your computer is sending a message to another computer saying, here's the information I want. It's sending your computer a bunch of little files. Those files all are all compiled, text files, photos, banners, everything. They're all compiled on a nice little, in a nice little application called the web browser, and that's what you're doing. You're downloading a bunch of data to your computer and looking at it. It's not a fancy place. It's not magic. It is nothing more than my computer talking to another computer, okay? So when when we talk about putting stuff in the cloud, we're really saying, hey, this computer, when I want access to that stuff in my storage unit, or anyone's storage unit, or let's say I want to share the stuff in my storage unit, share some of the stuff with some people, but keep some of it behind a locked door, I'm really just talking from one computer to another. That's all we're doing, okay? I don't know how it works. I don't know how it works. I don't know how blood gets oxygen out of my lungs and carbon dioxide. I don't know how electricity really works either. I really don't. I mean, I, there's something about electrons and flying over wires and powering stuff. But you know what? We don't need to know how it works. 
we need to know how to use it, right? We need to know what the end result is, not, not all the, the I, you know, I could, if, if you could tell me how it worked, I'd probably be bored and start sleeping also. But really, we need to know what the tools are and how they're being used. So, when one computer talks to another computer and the storage facility for all of my, all of my stuff, it's just one computer talking to another. We talk about it as if it's some sort of phantasmic place. We got the cloud, but really, what is the cloud? The cloud is on top of all the networks and all the little things, all the computers we have in our office, and on top of all the things that we have in our homes and all the things that we connect to the cloud. Well, we're connecting them. Other businesses are doing the same thing. All those websites, all that Facebook data, all of those Google aggregated searches with all of the world's information that's at our fingertips now. And man, I wish I would have had that in high school. I would have plagiarized from World Book a lot less <laughs> if, I, <laughs> if I had that in high school. But the data center, the place that the cloud actually lives, is nothing more than a giant warehouse. It actually looks like a storage facility. It's nothing more than a giant warehouse. Giant warehouses all over the country, all over the world. And the thing that these warehouses have that make them better than your facility at your office or at your house is they are climate controlled. They have internet pipes coming in, gigantic fiber connections to, uh, across multiple carriers, multiple carriers being AT&T, uh, and if there's, let me stop and say, if there's any a term that you don't understand, don't just drop off, raise your hand, ask me, what are you talking about, okay? Uh, carriers are, are AT&T, CenturyLink, uh, we have Bluestream as a carrier, as ca Comcast. Those carriers all provide the backbone, the connection pipes, the cabling in the walls that I used to do, but not in the walls, under the street, under the ocean, they pipe these into these data centers so that these data centers have connections. And then inside these data centers, we have rows and rows and rows of racks and computers. Now these computers don't have monitors because they don't need them because we'll, you know, when people manage them, they're managing them, from, they're managing them from a console that gives them the output of what they need to see. These, this is the cloud. Massive amounts of computers in giant buildings with internet connections all over the country. That's the magic. They're on the ground, by the way. They're not in the sky with your data. They're right here. They're, they're all over the country. They have biometric security, so you know your average person can't just walk in and start, oh, I know that this is, belongs to Google, or I know this. You can't, an average person can't just walk in. You have to have credentials, just like a lot of the other places biometric security, 24-7 uh, access. A lot of times companies that, have, that provide cloud and web services to other businesses actually have offices right there inside the data center that they rent from the data center. But that's, that's the magic of the cloud. It's, it's, it's computers talking to computers. Does anybody have any questions on that? Does anybody, has anybody gotten a light bulb or did everybody already know that? Okay. Um, you hear a lot of things about, so now I'm going to use the word cloud, and now that everybody knows it's not magic, I'm going to use it, and, and if, again, if there's any question as to what I'm talking about, um, there are basically three types of cloud models, and, and it's like a, a, Venn a Venn diagram, which is what I have here next. The private cloud, the private cloud is if I took my stuff, and I put it in this data center, and, I, and I, I rented or bought this rack and this rack for IBIS technology, and IBIS technology was gonna buy its own equipment, put it in that rack, or I'm gonna rent space from another equipment provider, and I'm gonna set it up with my own security, my own corporate network. When I say corporate network, I know it's another fancy term that just basically means all the data that my company shares with each other, shared files, shared folders, shared QuickBooks databases, shared accounting packages, anything that we as a company share together is, part, is our corporate network, and we allow access to that with usernames and passwords. So a private cloud is my own private network, but instead of my own private network being in my office or in my closet, it's here in a rented data center. 
okay? A public cloud, a lot of you are already familiar with the public cloud. You use the public cloud all the time. Facebook is an example of a public cloud. Google is an example of a public cloud. Salesforce, public cloud. Amazon Web Services, has anybody ever done anything in Amazon Web Services before? Public cloud, so in other words, big companies that we know the names, IBM just purchased a huge company just this, just this week called Red Hat, $36 billion for something that nobody here has ever heard of, but yeah, that's a lot of money to be able to compete with IBM, or to be able to compete with Amazon and Google and Microsoft in this public cloud space, okay? The public cloud is, hey, I don't have to have all my own stuff, or I have, uh, sale, let's use Salesforce as an example. Has anybody heard of Salesforce.com? Mm -hmm. Salesforce.com is what's called, in, in its most basic function, a CRM, or a Customer Relationship Management Tool, okay? So I'm a customer, I'm an enterprise, I've got 10,000 customers, or maybe I've only got 500 customers. But I have all the data, if anybody's ever used a program like ACT, or some people do it out of their Outlook, where they, it's basically contact management, right? Customer relationship management is a fancy name for how often have I talked to this person? How can I send emails to this person as, as, as part of a group of larger people? When did I talk to them last? Do I need to schedule a meeting with them? What was my last contact with them? That's all customer relationship management, or CRM. Salesforce.com, for a subscription fee, will let you purchase their CRM for your own private use in their public cloud. Doesn't mean they have access, unless you grant it in one of those long uh, forms that you, nobody ever reads, to access your data and sift through your data, unless you give them permission to. But it means that you're have, you have your customer relationship management software with a, a company, and it's shared with, the, that company provides the same software for everybody else and it's in this public shared workspace. It might be, it's isolated by your username and passwords, but it's in a shared workspace. That's the public cloud, okay? And really what everybody ends up with is a hybrid cloud. We have some that's proprietary just to our company, and we have some that we use the public space. For example, Ibis Technology is a hybrid cloud solution. We have our ho cloud hosted desktops, which I can't wait to show you later. But we also use uh, G Suite for our email, which is Google Apps or Gmail, <laughs> Gmail. Uh, D. Levy at Ibis Technology and all of the associated emails with Ibis Technology, Evans, uh, they're all, it's, a, it's, it's the public cloud, it's Google, and we use it in our own private systems, so it's a hybrid cloud. We use some public cloud, some private cloud, hybrid. That's the three models of cloud. And so, again, maybe this is just a, an, an example of how we distill the jargon down from what you might hear on TV. I, I just heard of pr the press release or the press conference where, where uh, the CEO, she was explaining how, why IBM bought Red Hat. And I'm listening to five minutes of this interview and I'm like, man, I only stand, understand about 30% of what she's saying. It, we use a lot of jargon in an industry and really, sometimes it makes it sound a lot fancier than it is. Sometimes I have no idea. But, but a lot of times it's a lot simpler than it might seem. Here's the visual of what we just talked about, right? We've got private cloud. Uh, maybe all of my desktops and the server. Everybody, does everybody know what a server is? Yeah? Because I'll get, I'll get that call or that email that says, I went to this website and it said my server's not available. Why is my server not available? Well, that's not your server that's not available. That's the server for whoever you were trying to, whoever computer you were trying to talk to is not available. A server is nothing more than another computer that instead of being a client where you are the client and actually looking at the information and using the information, it's serving you the information. It's the house of the information. It's providing some kind of services. It's like your waiter at Chili's is a server. He's bringing you the food, right? He's bringing you the drinks. He's your server. He's bringing you the data. That's what a server is. Okay, so when you look at a picture like this and you say, oh, there's a bunch of desktops and a server and all of this is in our private cloud, 
And then you've got examples of the public cloud, whether it's uh, Amazon Web Services or Salesforce. We can even do, I know a big topic that we're going to get to here shortly is security, firewalls, and all this different stuff that's supposed to protect us from the, the evildoers. Um, Cloudflare is an example of one that uses, that's used to secure websites. So who's ever heard of an attack where, hey, I went to this website and all of a sudden, it was supposed to be a legitimate website and all of a sudden my computer seems like it's not running properly or it's hacked or it's by a mount. Well, Cloudflare is a company, a, cl a public cloud service company that protects websites. So rather than a, somebody who might have a website on their server investing in all of that security for their website, they'll outsource their security to a Cloudflare and so now every time you go to that website or every time that website is accessed, you're accessing it through the Cloudflare services. So that's nothing more than them providing protection on the way in and on the way out for anything that tries to touch that website's servers. So that's an example, outsourcing the security is in the public cloud. Who uses Office 365? Yeah, public cloud, right? All your stuff is your stuff but Microsoft is the one that holds all, that has all the infrastructure that provides all of the back end details that most of us don't know and don't even want to know. So again, companies use a combination of both hybrid cloud. Everybody following along? Okay. Software, here are types that you might hear of cloud computing. Software as a service, who's ever heard that term before? Um, software as a service is like that Cloudflare I just talked about, or Salesforce I just talked about. Going to a website, anybody that provide, that any company that would provide a product that you can use to manage your business, but is their public facing website. Office 365 is the perfect example, right? Uh, it, it, when you're using Office on your computer, you're not using the cloud necessarily, but when you have all your documents stored on OneDrive or using Google Apps, you're using software as a service. You're not buying the software, you're paying a subscription fee for it, or you're looking at advertising because it's free and, they, and that's the fee that you're paying, but that's software as a service. Infrastructure as a service. I mentioned AWS before, which is Amazon Web Services, or Google or Microsoft, they provide infrastructure, whereas I, if I have an application, or if I have a program, or if I have data that I want to use as a business, and I don't want to buy all of this servers, and racks, and tools, I can rent space, just storage space, or storage space with lots of tools connected to it from Amazon. And Amazon is going to charge me based on how often I access, on how much I use, which is a really small amount, and then how much I access. So that's a variable amount. If we access it a lot, if we use these, this data and this storage a lot, they charge us more. That's infrastructure as a service. So I don't have to buy anything. I'm buying it as a service. I'm outsourcing it. As a service is basically a way of saying outsourcing. Okay? Instead of purchasing it, I'm purchasing it as a service platform as a service, and desktop as a, uh, I'm not going to go into all the details on these, but desktop as a service is what a cloud-hosted desktop is, okay? And again, I'm going to get to that a little bit more because I'm going to show a demonstration of our cloud-hosted desktop. It's not, this is not an infomercial for IBIS technology, but it is what we do, and that's the, that's the area of the cloud that we operate in, is the cloud-hosted desktop space desktop as a service. Instead of you actually going out every three years, which is what you should, I'll talk to some and they're like, oh, I've had my computer for eight years. Okay, well that's great. <laughs> that's great. I don't know how you're still using it because it's probably slower than molasses, but uh, rather than going out and buying new desktops every time you have a new person start or every time somebody's desktop is due for a refresh, we make it so that you can just use any device, whether it's this laptop or uh, an, an old Windows 7 machine, even XP will work, you're able to access your brand new Windows 10 style PC that's in the cloud from that device. So that's desktop as a service. I have a question. Sure. Is this why um, you buy a 
computer or laptop, mm -hmm. and they don't have the CD. You know, remember you would get yeah, the different things, and you would put the CD in, which was convenient if you could find it. Right. Um, well, that's more to do with how software is delivered, and software delivery is another big was one of the first things that, that was implemented by the cloud, which is why they got rid of the, the CD player that's actually in the laptop, and now if you want one, you have to buy one that you can plug in, because rather than provide you with CDs, uh, plastic pieces of, you know, that have laser-written software on them, we're able to deliver all of that now just by downloading it. They just download it now. So, Rather than, you know, that CD, a CD, when we first were using them, were able to hold 750 megabytes worth of data if they were full. Well, a program like Office, Microsoft Word, or QuickBooks that you might have originally purchased on a CD, um, those are usually only about 100 to 200 megabytes. Now, I know I don't want to start talking megabits and megabytes, and nobody knows the size is what I'm talking about, but... Now we can download a 200 megabyte, 200 megabyte piece of software like QuickBooks. I, I mean, help me out, Vince, in, in, in less than a minute, right? I mean, you can, 30 seconds to a minute. So let's eliminate the mechanical piece that can break. Let's eliminate the distribution piece that's expensive by, by populating CDs all over the world. Hey, we'll still give it to the people who are old school and want to do it that way until we can no longer find the 8-track player, I mean the CD player. <laughs> attached to the computer, right? So now we're able to download that. But that's another, that's an example of cloud delivery of software. Selling something on Amazon, selling a piece of software from, from, from Microsoft or from Intuit who provide QuickBooks or any piece of software that you might buy or any piece of software that you might download for free. Uh, there is no free, so you know. And if there is free, I'm the only one who knows about it, okay? <laughs> Uh, all those little pieces of software that you install by double-clicking that, uh, that icon that you just downloaded, again, can be dangerous, and we'll get to that too, but that's an example of cloud delivery of software instead of physical delivery of software. Yes? Couldn't Dropbox and OneDrive all be Dropbox and OneDrive are 100% are cloud services. Dropbox, uh, you're in, in a situation, they're, they're public cloud services, Okay, because you're not, you are buying a, um, you're buying a subscription or you're getting it for free if you're using a, a, a free version to, of storage to synchronize all your devices because you want to be able to have the same, you want the same document no matter whether I'm using this one, I'm using my laptop or if I'm using my desktop at home or if I want to share that with somebody else, I need some public storage space that I have control over that I can share with some people, but I want control over. And if I make that change to that PowerPoint presentation, I don't want that, I want that change to be everywhere where I might access it. I don't want to have to remember, oh, I have the old version on my desktop at home. Let me go home and get a, a, an eight track tape or a CD or a thumb drive, which are also really cool, but also starting to become more and more obsolete because of the cloud. So Dropbox and synchronization between your phone and your different devices is all part of using the cloud. And Dropbox, the company Dropbox, or Google, or Microsoft, when you do use those tools, your stuff is on their servers. It is, it, you're, every time you touch a Dropbox file, and it synchronizes, it's synchronizing to the mothership, which is, which is Dropbox servers, right? So you're sharing your data, but you're not really sharing it because it's, nobody, would, nobody would use those services if they felt that, uh, that other people had access to their data if it was really. Now, we're gonna talk about hacking in a few minutes and we're gonna talk about how services can be hacked and what the end result is, but yes, if all things are, are operating the way they're supposed to, Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, all cloud services. Let's talk about cloud-hosted virtual desktops, okay? This is what IBIS technology does. This is our focus. This is just one cloud service amongst many that we've already talked about. But a cloud-hosted virtual desktop, and hopefully you can maybe tell by the picture here as to what I'm talking about, because I'd like to, I'd like to use this image of a Windows desktop on any device 
shows you that you're able to log in to your, your Windows desktop, the thing that currently sits on your desk or under your desk that collects dust and cat ball fur or whatever and, and can occasionally crash and gets full of junk and starts moving slowly. And, and that is a traditional desktop computer. And we've been using them for, what, three decades now. And they're great. But there's a lot of drawbacks to doing it that way. And what the internet and the cloud has provided us now is a way to deliver that Windows desktop, that Windows environment that you're used to, but deliver it over the internet so that the device you're using to access it really doesn't make a difference. And you would say, okay, that's great. You know, we have, we have remote desktops at work where people have their desktops and they can remote into them from home and what can they do with them and all this different stuff. Well, we're not even doing that. If you can tell, this is a picture of the office where people might work. They're using at their office the same cloud-hosted desktops that we might use at home on our PC at home or on our laptop on the road or even on our iPad or iPhone. The actual desktop itself the actual Windows platform and all of the software installed on it and all of the services that we might use from it, Dropbox, Google, Microsoft Office, Exchange, Outlook, all of it is stored in that big rack <laughs> that we showed you on all those servers, and that is my desktop, and I can access it from anywhere. So if you can see, what it provides me is access to my desktop, but it provides me centrally managed it provides central management of that desktop also. And when the desktop is in a secure environment like the one that I showed you as opposed to in that, uh, on that thing underneath your desk, we have a lot more control, we have a lot more features and services and upgrades and things that we can do here at the data center that you can't do to your computer when it's sitting underneath your desk at home. It's really unbelievable what you can do. So I'm gonna demonstrate right now what that looks like. Okay, so this, this is the laptop I'm on right now, okay? It's just plain Windows laptop, bought it at Costco, Dell, love it. I'll tell a story about it in a minute. This is the desktop. I don't have hardly anything on it, because there, you know what? There's almost nothing on this laptop, honestly. The story that I was going to tell was if this laptop, if I went up to the roof and throw this laptop off or I got stolen on the train or stolen off the plane or thrown in the, in the ocean, I lose nothing. I lose nothing. And not just because it's all backed up. Yes, that's important if you're still doing it the traditional way, which is that laptop or desktop that's sitting on your desk, but not me. Not me. I access... This, I'm showing my PowerPoint presentation from it, this is my cloud-hosted desktop, okay? It looks just like a Windows desktop. I use it just like a Windows desktop. All of my information is here. Okay, let's see what I was working on before I left the house. Okay, my email, right? All of my applications, I've got my QuickBooks on here, I've got my, I've got, all of my data, everything, my company shares this. We've got, we've got six users in our company. Uh, my administrator, she works from my office two days a week. She works from uh, another office three days a week. She works from home sometimes. She's able to access it as if we're sitting in the office right next to each other. She's able to access her desktop. We're sharing files and folders. We're sharing QuickBooks data. I've got a Dropbox connection here that's, that connects to the public cloud, like we talked about. So it's an example of us being hybrid. But everything that you might find on your computer is right here in a cloud-hosted desktop. I could log on to it from my phone, OK? It sounds like it wouldn't be too useful. But we do have attorneys that are in court that, want, that need that document. And they know it's on their desktop. They log into their desktop. They send, it to their e they send it to themselves. Now it shows up in their email on their phone or on their iPad. It's a great, it's a great use case. Uh, another great use case is sometimes I leave the office and I forget to log out. But when I log in from my phone, it automatically shuts off wherever I was last. So if I'm in my car at a red light, of course, <laughs> um, 
I'm able to log in and basically log off my computer at the office or wherever, wherever I was last. There are an enormous amount of features and functions that we can do with this that you can't do with your systems at the office. Um, whether it's backup and disaster recovery, and we're going to cover all. We're going to cover those things. I want to. I want to give another chance for questions before I go into a little a little survey that I was going to email everybody, but I didn't have everybody's email, so we'll go through it together in a minute. But uh, before I go into that, is there any other questions on on what a desktop as a service is? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's always the first question. Yes. Okay. So that's always the first question because for some reason, when everyone considers cloud-hosted desktop, they want to know what's going to happen when they're on the plane, or on the train. Bless you. Or that's all right. Or they're in rural rural America where their internet is horrible. Okay. So here's a drawback for cloud-hosted anything. It requires internet connection. But as we discussed before. Um, certain cloud-hosted services can be, can be used to synchronize, like a Dropbox, where you can have private versions of Dropbox, where you can, like you said, not check files out, but you can move files that if, for some reason, while you're going to be on your trip, you're disconnected, you have access to those files. Um, but yes, one of the stipulations of cloud-hosted anything, for the most part, is a good internet connection. Um, yes? Without the software being on the computer, the, so the files are no good. Right. They're no good. So, so in, a in a case of a road warrior, which is a setup that we commonly refer to at, for somebody who is on the road and traveling who might be disconnected, we have a local version of Office. We have a local version of Dropbox or a similar type proprietary tool. We bring the files that we have a, a folder that. All of those punch holes in the security that we set up. Uh, in that situation, we would have to make sure the device is secure too, because you don't want to have the information that you bring down that you have on the device and the device be insecure. So that's what we do. We provide, we provide, we punch holes in our security to enable, to facilitate ease of use in that situation. But if you're not a road warrior, you're not getting that. You follow what I'm saying? And then, and then. You know, obviously, it's up to business owners. We try and explain all the risks, but it's up to business owners to decide ultimately, hey, I'm willing to risk this for the ability to do that, but I'm not, or, or I shouldn't, or you know what? He's on a plane three hours a week at the most. He can, he'll be fine with his email, you know, or whatever it might be. So again, there are advantages. I'm not going to stand up here and say that there are no disadvantages. The disadvantage to anything that's entirely cloud-based is that you have to have an internet connection. You have to have an internet connection, which are becoming ubiquitous. So the more and more we fly, the more and more we travel, the less and less quality internet connections are going to continue to be. Yeah, Cindy. I have a question. Sure. Do you usually use uh, logging in? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's also a cloud service, but as we discussed, as we discussed, log me in is a great. And we use log me in to 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 service some of our clients' computers who are old school, who have the old tech. I don't want to say old technology and it's old school. Have a traditional setup because ninety five percent of you have the traditional setup. I'm talking about something that's not bleeding edge. It's not even cutting edge, but it's leading edge. It's it's technology that that companies are using now if they're setting up their infrastructure or if they're re, they're refurbishing their their setup. But most companies still use that traditional model. Log me in allows you to log into that box that's sitting under your desk or that sitting it instead of let's go. Oops. Log me in. Instead of your PC being hosted on, in, in the cloud or on one of those thousands of servers, you're logging, in, you're logging into your PC at the office from your laptop using log me in. So you're actually looking at this machine that's sitting in your office. And the associated risks that's, that 
are, are uh, going to be apparent to this machine are still apparent to this machine. You have none of the benefits that we can talk about here, but you're still able to, you have accessibility is the only thing that you've really gotten. We talk about three things, and I'm about to get to that right now. Security, productivity, and accessibility. LogMeIn provides you accessibility. It's not always the fastest or best connection. It's great for doing one or two things, but if you really need to do, get a lot of work done, you don't want to work over something that's LogMeIn because it's really meant to just sort of remotely administer that machine, not really get production done. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes? No, cloud-hosted desktops are, in fact, IBIS technology doesn't even sell its own cloud-hosted desktop, okay? I am, like I told you, I, I, I'm a, I'm a self-taught IT guy. Uh, I know a lot. I, I hope and pray. No, I don't hope and pray. I know there are a lot of engineers and a lot of infrastructure companies that can provide these suites of services better than I can. and and. 24-7, 365 support. So IBIS technology uh, partners with other companies to provide these cloud-hosted desktops, and then we add a layer of service on top of it so that we can, we can facilitate our clients uh, getting the service they need or if there's an issue. I'm not going to stand up here and say that, no, that like any other PC, there may be issues associated with it. Generally, we can solve them a lot quicker. But we still need to provide that level of service to our clients. Our clients are expecting to be able to have a help desk for them. That's where IBIS technology steps in. So we partner with other clients. We resell their desktops. We do our research to make sure that the product that we're selling meets our standards. And then we facilitate our clients subscribing. It's really a subscription to, to, desk, to cloud hosted desktops. And that's the nice part about it too. Uh, from a productivity standpoint, if I were to go out now and say, hey, I gotta buy a new server and new desktops for my business. Let's see, I gotta buy a server that's gonna be five grand at a minimum. I gotta buy 20 desktops. Like, I have to, and, and maybe my business is gonna be 25 or maybe it's gonna be 15 next year, but I have to try and decide now how much capacity I need for my servers and my, you don't need that with this model. This model is consume what you need. You have more people come to your business, we spin up another, two, another desktop. You have people leave, you're a seasonal business, we shut you down on that desktop and you don't pay for it anymore. So that's another advantage is the scalability of a cloud-hosted environment as opposed to having to come out of your pocket and purchase it by yourself. Make sense? Can I have one question that? Sure. Does it mean that you can get a stripped down model almost terminal instead of buying some fancy schmancy? Uh, yes, in fact, that's exactly what it means. In fact, that's what I do. We had a, we had a story, we had a blog post called Tom Loses His Laptop. I was going to uh, talk to you about it earlier, but it ended up happening to me. Actually, Tom is fictional. Tom's a fictional <laughs> CEO. Tom's on a train and he loses his laptop on a train while he's traveling. Um, and we advise him, you know, if that, were, if that were to happen, and Tom worked for any company, whether it was a Fortune 500 or, or um, a small company here in Coral Springs, Tom had all his stuff on his laptop. Not only is Tom's stuff vulnerable, but he doesn't have it now. He doesn't have anything. He doesn't have his applications. He doesn't have his stuff. We, told, we tell Tom to go to Costco, to go to the closest store, Buy, the, buy any laptop he wants. It can be a $300 model, $400 model, $1,500 model, whatever you want. Come back, we install the icon, we install a little piece of software that allows him to access, boom, he's right into his cloud-hosted desktop. It doesn't matter what kind of, like I said, we've run it on Windows XP machines before, um, Windows 7 machines, which are getting old. Now, there are some security issues that you might have and some compliance issues, depending on what kind of business you are, if you're still running old desktops in your business, even if they're just nothing more than consoles, like you said, or dumb terminals, which is really what, effect, in effect, they are. But um, yeah, we do that all the time. And in fact, you don't even necessarily need a Windows device. Like I run my Windows desktop on my Mac. Uh, I can log into that same Windows desktop from a Mac. We have lots of lots of CEOs and 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 
artistic types who love their Macs and don't want to give up their Macs, mostly students too, don't want to give up their Macs, well don't, don't. But if you're wanting to, but the company's platform is Windows, so you can bring your own device. It doesn't hurt, it doesn't, it's not a security issue for us. We're, we're able to allow you to log into your Windows desktop from any device. Yeah, so it, uh, yeah, that's a great question. And yes, on the hardware side, it reduces the cost dramatically, dramatically. Oh, yes. Yes, who, own, who owns the cloud? It's a company, it's a company with shareholders like uh, Amazon and Google and this and that, or what? Well, I mean, you can saw, you could talk about the cloud in terms of market share and say all of those companies in effect own the cloud. You could say Cisco owns the cloud because 95% of the networking gear in all of those data centers and in all is made by Cisco, but they don't really own it. They own they uh, they own and provide the infrastructure to allow all of the end users, businesses to own their own stuff, even if it's in your own private data center. Now, companies build data centers in their own buildings. They own the data center, they own the gear, they own the infrastructure, but it's still part of the cloud because it's still part of the internet. So it, the internet, the cloud is a communal, in, a communal society of the world's data. But who pays for all the infra, infra structure that the cloud requires? Uh, corporate, corp, the, the corporation, the corporate world, for sure, and and the, and the government, government world, government, corporate, the same constituents that would participate. Well, if this, the government is interesting because some people talk about the confidentiality and privacy of the information in the cloud. Okay. Because, for example, if you have a lawyer that has a client lawyer. Uh, commitment and the contract is in the cloud, the government can go inside without subpoena. Mm, I, I mean, you're getting into a legal area that I know is always going to be at the top of the, uh, I, but we had, and if I remember correctly, we had a huge, huge controversy over whether somebody's iPhone should be allowed to be unlocked or whatever it might be. Um, that's really not my area as to the proprietary legal nature, but let me tell you something else. It, the cloud, the same, the same government can confiscate those machines underneath your desk and, and do the same thing. So if, you're, if your data, if you have data at risk of being compromised uh, for legal purposes or for whatever it is, the constituents who would do that are the, the government or the companies or, I mean, it, whether it's cloud technology or even personal technology, which is a lot easier to get into than cloud technology, um, that's that's always going to be there. That's part of the uh, that's part of the Big Brother scenario that we're living under. But here's what I say to those people, and I get this question all the time, right? It was even as far back as when I would be like, "What are you? What are you buying stuff on Amazon? And you're buying airplane tickets? I don't want to give my credit card over the internet. Someone's going to take my credit card information and going to buy stuff with it." Well, I tell them, I said, well, you just gave your credit card to the, to the waiter at Chili's and he took it in the back. And, and so, you know, or you know, I, don't want to, I don't want everyone to know where I am all the time. And I don't use Facebook. Well, I, well you also use a sun pass and a cell phone and a credit cards. And so trust me, you're not off, unless you're 100% off the grid, you're not off the grid. There is no selective use of technology. So to them, I say, do nothing wrong and don't worry about it. I mean, it's a very simple and simplistic answer, but um, you know, hopefully, we never live in that age where where government has more of our rights than we do. But you know, it's going to constantly, it's going to always be at the forefront of technology. Is the, the legal question? You had another question? Yes. If I want to go home and use a cloud like desktop, um, like you like talk about, but not from like a corporate perspective. Mm -hmm. How much would that cost you? Uh, you can get from Amazon Web Services a plain Jane, it's called their workspaces, and there's a, probably a few providers, but you can get their cloud-hosted desktop for probably on the order of $30 a month, $30 to $40 a month, something like that. Uh, you want it to be a little bit beefier, you want it to do a little different things. There's, like I said, there's lots of providers, but um, you know, when doing something like that, I generally like to stick with a name that I know 
because there's like some accountability with it. But yeah, you can get something along those lines for relatively, I mean, relatively inexpensively, I think. Uh, we can discuss the, the economics of it at any point in time, but, uh, and, and, and we can, but the economics of the cloud versus the economics of doing it yourself or the, the uh, traditional way, if you compare apples to apples, they're very similar. They're very similar. Joy. What are your thoughts about the dark web? The dark web. Well, I have an email that I printed out, or that I, let's see here. That's the checklist. What is the dark web? The dark web. The dark web is the underbelly of the internet. It sound, it sound, it's, it's a marketing thing as well. It's the cloud. It's the internet. It's no different than the other internet. It's not using a different internet. It is the seedier part where People would exchange stolen credit card numbers. People would try and perpetrate scams, uh, ra malware, ransomware, all, you know, steal, stolen, stolen information. You can go in in sort of a in sort of a try and access via an anonymous fashion, so they don't they can't track where you're accessing from and what usernames you're using. And there's all kinds of technologies. It's a cat and mouse game. The dark web is probably more illuminated than people think. But, uh, you know, and sometimes they just keep an eye on what's going on in order to keep, to keep an eye on what's going on. So uh, the dark web, we all experience it all the time. Okay, we've all seen these headlines. City of Atlanta was hacked. Uh, Home Depot, T-Mobile, two million records stolen. Hospital systems all the time. Records stolen. I mean, the social security number might as well be printed on a billboard at this point because it doesn't really matter. It's not a safe and secure thing. But there's no way that we can prevent that. We're not in control of, of T-Mobile's or, or the hospital system's data. So our stuff is out there, right? Every time you create a new login at a new web portal and you put your email address in because that's the username is required and you type in a password, that's stored somewhere, right? Why did that IT guy say it's not right to use that same password for everything? Hmm. But, uh, <laughs> and we could talk about a way to, we could talk about a pretty unique and easy way to, to get around that too, um, which I know Joy, I've mentioned it to Joy a number of times. But uh, why, it, so you're getting an email, these databases are hacked and they have the email address and they have the password that you use to create that thing, that account on T-Mobile or that account on Home Depot. And when they hack that and they get all those emails and all those passwords and they send you that email saying, hey, this is your email, it's been hacked, and we know your password, here it is. And you're like, wait, I use that password for everything. <laughs> well, that's because you use that password for everything. But they, don't ha they haven't ha hacked your computer, they're not looking at you. They have, listen, they have emails. They have, they, there are definitely security issues, and I want to go into a bunch of them if, if you guys are interested in it. But um, yes, security, security is the number one issue that everybody brings up. And how can we do security better, okay? So before we get into everything that's security, productivity, and accessibility, like I said, I had this little survey that I created. Let's see if we can get it up here. Okay, so let's go through it together because it could, it could uh, bring up some good questions. The term cloud computing refers to, this term, ter I hate reading off of slides, but I'm going to read because maybe you can't see it. Raise your hand if the answer applies to you. This term terrifies me and I avoid it at all costs. I'm not sure what cloud computing is, but I think I have it on my phone. I am familiar with the concepts of cloud computing, but I am not sure how it fits into my business. Cloud computing, you are, now you're speaking my language. Everybody fall into that spectrum? Do more people fall under, the, under here than under here? Have we, have we cleared up a little bit of it? Have we made some progress? Great. So I'm going to say you're now speaking my, oh, maybe I'm familiar with it. Okay. So this, by the way, this survey, like SurveyMonkey, this survey I did on Google Apps, right? Or G Suite, they call it now. This survey is a cloud host, is a cloud service, right? This Google Forms that will actually help me create this, or SurveyMonkey, or Survey, or whatever you're using, actually creates the forms, allows your users to go to it, 
allows them to fill out data, then I can go in and look at all, it creates a spreadsheet of all everybody's answers and creates graphs and all kinds of things without me asking to do anything. Cloud service, very easy to use, very easy to use. Okay, this is a big one. And this is a big one as it relates to the cloud, in cloud in general, security. Disaster preparation for business. If Hurricane Irma, this was the track of Hurricane Irma. I know everybody that was living here that was following it um, was terrified. I was terrified. It was bearing down on us as a Category 5 storm. Honestly, on the map at one point, the, the eye of the hurricane separated the words coral and springs on the, on the map. I mean, that's how it was like heading right for my house, right? If it had plowed through South Florida, like Michael recently did in the Panhandle, and you've seen that destruction, or if anyone was around here during Andrew and got, went down to Miami and saw the destruction there, what kind of plan does everybody have in place for their business? I don't know if everybody has a business with lots of servers or, or people working for it, or if everybody's got their own individual situation, but we have no plan in place and hoped the hurricane would miss us. That's the number one plan, okay? That's the number one plan, praying. The number one. I'm not even, that's not, and it's not even close, okay? We made backups of all our relevant data and took backup media off-site. That's old school, old technology, but a lot of people do it. A lot of people claim they do it when really they have one. They claim they have number two, because when we ask them, how do you make backups of your data? Well, I, I have a USB drive, I plug it in, we back up the server, we rotate them, I take it home. I ask people, when was the last time someone from your office took it home? <laughs> when was the last time someone from your office checked to make sure it was working and that the data on it is the data you need? We backed up all of our relevant data to cloud-based backup and recovery service like Carbonite, Datto, Amazon Web Services. A lot of people use these. They're excellent tools if you have a laptop. And listen, cloud-hosted desktops is not for everybody. They're more for businesses, although as an individual, I would want one too because uh, I have I, experience in it now, and now I want my desktop wherever I am. But if you're not, if it's not the model for your business, you got to have some kind of automated, checked, reports to you via email or something that it's worked, backup. There is, I mean, I, I, I'm going to say that my, sis, my mom called me yesterday. My sister lives in Israel and told me my sister's apartment was broken into in Tel Aviv and everything was stolen. Two laptops, external hard drives, everything stolen. And I feel horrible. I haven't talked to her yet. This was yesterday evening, our time, so I'm going to talk to her after this uh, feel bad. I hope that she had everything backed up. I really do. It's all gone. It's all gone. And so we talk about the hurricane, but more, a, a more likely scenario is you're, you get violated, robbed, something happens, a flood, storm, whatever it is, you have either natural disaster or some sort of crime perpetrated against you and all your stuff is gone. All your stuff is gone. Windows and Word and Office and applications, they can all be replaced. But the stuff, the data that you have in it is the lifeblood of business. Without that data, some people have to close up shop. Some people have to close up shop. And then, of course, we have the we only use cloud-based systems so we don't have to worry about it. That's my plug for the cloud-hosted desktop because that whole environment all, and all the data in it is backed up constantly, is backed up not only in that one data center where it exists, but the nice part about data centers and their fat bandwidth pipes is that we can replicate from one data center to another. So the, any of the vendors I use have three data centers. We operate out of one, but all of the data, all of the servers, all the desktops, and all of their data is backed up to multiple data centers throughout the country every night, every night. So even in a situation where one of them might go offline because the backhoe ripped up the cable, in an hour we can be operating out of a different data center. But again, I'm, uh, I sound like an infomercial for cloud-hosted desktops, which I'm really not trying to, but in that scenario, all of our stuff is backed up all the time, and so it's, it's, it's a huge headache lifted from the, from the business owner or from the IT director who's responsible to make sure everything is backed up. 
that, every, that you know, when you're in a cloud-hosted system, everything is automatically backed up, or it should be. But at the very minimum, for the individuals in the room, uh, even, even those that might use Dropbox, which was mentioned before, uh, it's imperative to have a backup solution, imperative. True or false, we've experienced uh, some type of hacking or cyber attack in our business. Show of hands, who's, got, who's true? Who's experienced some sort of hacking or cyber attack? Really? Wow, you guys are all extraordinarily lucky and not good for, setting, for making a point. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I will, I will tell you what one of the FBI directors, who I won't mention his name now because some people think it's political, but what, anyway, I was watching a 60 Minutes and Director Comey at the time <laughs> was um, doing an interview and here's what he said. He said there are two types of companies, those who have been hacked and those who have been hacked but don't know it yet. That's it. It is an inevitable, it's an inevitability, it's a numbers game. These attacks, a lot of them are automated. It's not like some individual, although there are some, and I'm gonna talk about one in a second. Uh, they're, they're primarily automated. They're out there just blanketing attacks and just waiting for somebody to click on the wrong thing. Just waiting for somebody to make, the, to make a mistake. And it is so much easier than you might think. Who's familiar with any of these terms? Phishing, spear phishing, malware, ransomware, social engineering, social media attack. These are all just examples of the types of attacks that are out there. Phishing you've all seen before, right? Phishing is where an email gets sent to you uh, purportedly from your bank or from some organization. You click on the link because it says you need to change of this or change of that. You go in, you click on the link, it looks like it's a, it looks like, I'm gonna use Bank of America or, or I'll use PNC because that's where I bank. Um, it looks like a PNC login page, but really it's not. Really it's not. That's happened at Police Harbor as well. All the time. Let me give you another example of a spear phishing attack. Spear phishing takes it one step further. Spear phishing is just like it sounds, instead of it being a blanket attack where they're out just fishing, they're actually targeting people. They're spear fishing. They're actually looking for specific targets. Usually it's the CFO or CEO or controller or somebody who has money, who has control over money. And here's how, here's, a, here's the anatomy of an attack that we just saw. You get an email that says, hey, I'd like you to take a look at this document or, you know, or hey, can you please take a look at this budget for me? Um, and it looks like it comes from, okay, I'll wrap it up. Uh, it looks like it comes from somebody that's important, okay? You open the link, maybe it's somebody that you deal with, it's a supposedly a Word document, and it says, hey, you can access this document, just sign into Microsoft Office, and up comes a Microsoft login page. It looks just like the Office 365 login page, and lo and behold, whether you're Office 365 subscriber or not, username and password for whatever your email system is. <laughs> Happens all the time, right? Now that person has your email and password for your, for your email. They go to your web-based email, they log in, and now they monitor you. They wait to see if you are somebody who has either access or has access to someone with money. I kid you not, this happens. This happened at a firm. They sent, they sent, they, they logged into their email and they were just monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. And when the transaction was ready to happen, they jumped in and sent an email changing the wiring instructions, putting in different wiring instructions. Half a million dollars went to an account and disappeared. Half a million dollars, this was one of my clients. It happens. All you have to do is change, sometimes they change just one letter in the domain name. Then you don't even look at it. abc.net becomes abd.com or whatever it might be. And then you, spear phishing, attacks. You, every, there are ways, there are things out there, there are cloud hosts, there are cloud providers, there are services that can help educate people. Um, ransomware is a huge one where you click on something and the city of Atlanta had this, so they click, somebody clicked on, or medical centers have this, they clicked on something and it, 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 it encrypts all the data. It's no longer usable unless you pay a Bitcoin ransom to some Eastern European country or person. 
It happens. It happens. How can we use the cloud to prevent that from happening? Security is one of the biggest, it sounds like it would be less secure, but it is so much more secure because we have the ability to roll back the clock. I can't get you a half a million dollars back, but if you click on the wrong link and it fries your entire computer system, we can roll back the clock. We can say, okay, let's take you back to four hours ago before anything bad happened, and boom, all your stuff is there. No ransoms, no what. We'll change the passwords, we'll do whatever. It's an important, it's an important thing. The, the, the security, I, I can't believe I'm almost out of time. Um, the security is one of the biggest features that we provide our clients because we know, we know, we know what's out there. Are we still playing cat and mouse? Sure, but our systems are hardened against the idea of an individual having that kind of, that kind of power to be able to put us out of business. I want to just cover one or two more things because I think it's a, a good, a great understanding about. Okay, all right, so let me, I got a lot more fun stuff. But anyhow, passwords, let me give a little password. Uh, let me leave you with a little bit of a password trick that I know that we use in our business all the time. You have, this is a simple trick. This has nothing to do with the cloud, by the way. Use an algorithm to create a password. And it sounds fancy, but it's really not. If you have a favorite password, or if you create a root saying, uh, could be the first, it, could be, it should have uh, some numbers in it, it should have, but this is the password that you love to use for everything, let's say, or create a new one that you want to use for everything. And then for each site that you go to, or for each thing, make it something unique about that site. For example, one that I usually use as an example is if it were Microsoft, right? I would have my root password might be, uh, hopefully it's not password one, two, three, but I'd have my root password, which might be, uh, you know, an old address of mine, uh, 6775 long, right? The capital L, got numbers, capital letter in it. And now I'm gonna put a lowercase m at the beginning and a capital T at the end. And I'm gonna know that every place I go to, Microsoft, it's gonna have the first letter lowercase, the last letter capital, and my root password will be the middle. But that password will never be the same for across all of my different properties, right? PNC will be a lowercase p, that same, that same 6775 long with a capital C at the end. And you could do capitals at the beginning and lowercase at the end. You can put a symbol in there if you want. Whatever it is, come up with an algorithm that enables you to change your password, yet you know how you create your password every time, or use LastPass, which is what we use also, which is a great password storage program that it's on your phone, you can have it, it's a cloud-based service. Again, it, uh, yes, of course, you're now relying on somebody else to be more secure than you are, but it's usually a bet that they are, because most people have password one, two, three. Uh, <laughs> or temp one, two, three, or I'm gonna change it later, one, two, three. Or right, <laughs> or at one, two, three. So anyhow, that's one of the tricks that we use. I'm gonna wrap it up. I have a lot more fun stuff to talk about, but you know, Cindy's got that glazed eye look, like all right, we've had enough. Uh, please, if, if it's for your business, obviously, or you know, we're always, whether, you know, please reach out to Evan, or Maria, or myself. We come to, we'll come to talk to you personally about what the best cloud strategy might be for your business. If it doesn't include our product, that would be fine too. Instead of, instead of money, we'll ask you to make sure you refer us to all of your friends that have businesses. Ibis Technology really caters to the 20 or 10, 20 to 200, 300 size businesses. Our largest client is just under 400 users. Our smallest client is four. So uh, if there's anything else, I'm here. I, I'm, I'm willing to answer questions if you want to stay after. But uh, thank you very much for coming this morning and listening. And uh, thank you, Cindy, for providing the forum. That was very interesting, David. Thank you. Um, I do want to take a few, few moments to recognize our, our 
sponsors of this event. Um, I want to tell you that it's very unique that our city, Coral Springs, supports our businesses by helping to retain them in the city by teaching you all of these relevant things. So I want to welcome up here Yu Subra from the De Office of Economic Development for the City of Coral Springs that graciously supports this program. Okay, hi. Good morning. Um, first of all, David, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I wish um, seven years ago my husband's office got broken into. He's a small business owner, and I wish he had the iCloud-based desktop at the time because he lost all of his data. It took about a couple of years to retrieve a lot of information. So I wish at the time he had that. <laughs> it would have been so much helpful. <laughs> Um, so anyway, good morning again. My name is Yu Subra, and I am the Economic Development Coordinator for the City of Coral Springs. So you may be wondering, what do I do in the Economic Development Office? So in short words, uh, what we do is that we, we work to expand and diversify the city's tax bases. Our job really is to recruit new businesses to come to Coral Springs, retain the existing ones, and assist all the local businesses who want to uh, expand their operation within you know, the city of Coral Springs. Um, this is so important to us because it helps create new jobs, employment opportunity to our citizens, and it is beneficial to the you know, ec economy of Coral Springs. So if you are a business owner in Coral Springs, I would like to meet with you, set up an you know, appointment with you. So I wanted to get to know more about your business, the product and services that you provide to your clients, and also if you have any issues or challenges with the city, I want to learn about it so we can help and provide some resources. Uh, that said, I also wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the program that we are working on at this moment. Right now, we are accepting nomination for the 2018 Business Excellence Awards. Going to read a little bit about that quickly. Um, this award is open to any big or small businesses within the Coral Springs boundary. This award is, um, aims to annually recognize and honor businesses for their hard work, innovation, excellence in customer service, show significant revenue growth in the past years, and so forth. As an award winner, you will receive a formal recognition and, and a special plaque during the regular city commission meeting. Uh, you also get press release posted to media outlets, including your company name published as an award winner we also create like a short film of your company featuring your success stories, and that goes out also on the media. And um, your company name and logo will be listed on the economic development website. Um, it is a great way to expose your company and celebrate your business success with your clients, with your families, friends, and the Coral Springs community at large. So to nominate your company or your favorite business, please go to our website at www.coralspringsedo.com and just fill out a two-minute quick form to nominate them. Um, the deadline is November 5th, it's next Monday, so if you can take two minutes of your time, please go to our website and nominate either your company or your favorite business in the Coral Springs area. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My phone number is 954-344-5771. Again, my phone number is 954-344-5771. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, I hope you guys learned a lot today. I know I did. Thank you very much, David. I really appreciate what you taught us. I also want to, again, thank the um, the Economic Development Office. I want to thank Commissioner Carter for being here today. And I also want to say I'm so excited to see our young people here from our DECA program and to see our future leaders learning with us. So thank you all for being here. And we hope to see you at our next class, which will be on Thursday, December 6th. And it will be entitled From Your Brand to Your Bottom Line, presented by Christine Matson from Mad for Marketing. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed yourself today, and I hope you take this back and you make your business even better. Thank you. Thank you.